thank you to all of you for being here tonight. I'm Tom Payton, publisher for Trinity University Press. And on behalf of TU Press and Texas Public Radio, welcome. Um, my job is mainly to welcome you and give a little bit of context for this program before we hand it off. And um, uh, this is a, a live event for the Maverick Book Club, which Trinity University Press has been doing, tied to our Maverick Books imprint since 2020. I think we've done 16 live events so far. But it's been kind of a learning journey. Of course, a lot of those were COVID and online, and now we've shifted back to in-person events. And it's kind of an evolving program for us. And that'll become clearer also, I think, as the evening goes on. Because we call it Maverick Book Club, and of course, uh, books our book clubs bring certain ideas to mind that we're going to talk really intensely about that book. And as a more of a mission-driven organization or publisher, uh, we, we engaged in kind of a discussion about what if the book, the book is great, any book is great, but what if we used a book, really viewed our books more as a launching point into some other deeper, broader, reframed, recontextualized, whatever the topic may may warrant a uh, kind of discussion and let's see how that works and we we kind of first worked with that with a book we published called um, uh, about the San Antonio flood by Char Miller and had a really really meaningful interesting discussion uh, that, that went well beyond the book and so in looking at the program tonight uh, Bobby and uh, Joyce and the entire team here at TPR were great in welcoming us to partner with them and uh, we enjoy our partnerships with them. We've co-published two books together, and now we're very happy to be doing some programming together and hope that that, that continues. Uh, but Bobby quickly mentioned, of course, we're west of the creek, and you've just published this book, West of the Creek. We'd love to be a part of that. And so we talked about what that might mean, decided to partner on this event. Uh, and, 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 and stepping back just a bit, how did we get to that point? Well, we, we looked at our list, and we had just brought out a new edition of a book that was kind of sleepy, but had been very popular for a long time, called West of the Creek. Uh, but we realized, and, 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 and the book was, had run out of copies, and so publishers hit the reprint button. But we said, let's wait a minute. I'm not sure we just want to hit the reprint button. First of all, let's freshen it up and give it a new cover. But also, we think it's uh, really important that it, through the limited means that this book has, it's important to try to start to recontextualize the story and then see where that goes, and hopefully leads to other programming and book projects. Um, because we realize you know, books, are, books are a static thing. They're, 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 they're a, especially nonfiction books. They're a moment in time. They are, they are, they are, they are official in someone's eyes as of that moment. They're someone's particular perspective. They're written for uh, what someone else thinks an audience may want or be interested in. But in fact, they often can just crack the door open to a broader discussion about how others may see that period, that area, that era, that story. And um, so we immediately, we, we immediately decided we wanted to move forward. We invited our, our good friend, the immensely talented Claudia Guerra, to add a new forward to this edition to help us start that process. And that's in this book you see, which I would be remiss if I didn't say is available for sale in the lobby, uh, if you'd like to get a copy. And then in stepping to this program, uh, we are particularly excited and humbled because we, th we made a l our little A list of well, who are two or three people we could get to come together and maybe talk about this and see where that discussion goes. Uh, and we made our list, and lo and behold, all of them said yes. <laughs> and, we, we, and we ended up with a, a wonderful, robust panel. Uh, we'll do the introductions in a moment. So thank you to our, 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 our panelists, uh, uh, for particip our participants, for being a part of this discussion tonight. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Marianne Navarro, who is going to host us this evening. And thank you for being here. Thank you, Tom, for that introduction. Hi, you guys. I'm Mariana Navarro. I'm a producer with Texas Public Radio. I work with Norma Martinez on Morning Edition and Fronteras. Thank you so much for making your way down to TPR tonight to engage in this conversation with us. We have a lovely, lovely panel, and it's going to be wonderful. I do want to let you guys know that we want you to be a part of this conversation as well. It's not just us up here, but it's also what you have to say. So if at any point during the discussion you have a question about something that's said, a question from the book and you'd like to come up and ask, we do have two different microphones set up on either side. Um, and we invite you to uh, ask a question, to engage in the conversation with us. It's a little scary to be the first one to go up there, but be brave. Uh, we always welcome it, and it makes for such a wonderful, wonderful conversation. So again, thank you so much for, for coming out. We have a lot to talk about in a, in a short amount of time, so I'll go ahead and get started. And I'm actually going to let the panelists introduce themselves and give a little bit about themselves. So um, I'll go ahead and start with Elaine. 
Hello, everybody. My name is Elaine Ayala. I was born steps from here at Santa Rosa Hospital, the first um, baby in my family born at a hospital. And um, we lived on San Fernando, right um, near the, the fields of Lanier High School. Uh, I grew up there, and then we moved to the Edgewood District, another very historical place. Um, I have to admit that I, uh, I didn't appreciate San Antonio until I moved from it. And then all I wanted to do was come back home. And I've been back, um, I've worked at five different papers before coming back and working at the Express News, where I've had a number of titles, and now I'm a Metro columnist for the paper, and I'm a podcaster. Um, my podcast is called Nosotros. You can get it wherever good podcasts are located, as well as YouTube. So I'm happy to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Claudia? Uh, hello, um, and just so you know, it's the lights are very bright, so I can't see all your faces, but uh, but we know our friends are out there. Thank you for coming tonight. Uh, I'm Claudia Guerra. Um, I uh, was born in the Baptist Hospital, okay. since we're going to do that. <laughs> uh, yeah, not too, too, too far. Neighbors, uh, neighbors. Uh, yeah. I, I'm not, but that's where, <laughs> yeah, that's where my mom my went mom for whatever born. reason. <laughs> Um, and I spent a lot of my youth on Seralvo Street near uh, the stockyards and slaughterhouses. Uh, and then we moved over to uh, Ricardo Street near Edgewood. So it was right next to a cemetery at that point. So uh, very well acquainted with the West Side. It was always a place of vibrancy and family for me. Uh, even when my family, my parents decided to move just uh, across from San Pedro Park instead. But I still spent most of my time on the West Side. Um, and I it's a little bit like Elaine when I, I left San Antonio and maybe that was when I really learned how much I appreciated it. And I think one of the most exciting things for me was when um, I moved to New York, had uh, my kids there, met my husband who's over there taking pictures. Um, and uh, when my kids came back and, you know, of course I took them to the West Side right away and my son was like, is this where we're gonna live? This is where I wanna live. And they still think of the West Side as the most vibrant part of the city and where they really wanna live. So someday I hope to make their dream come true. Um, when I wrote the foreword, I was um, the city's cultural historian working for the city of San Antonio. Um, I still work for the city of San Antonio, but I am now the assistant director for diversity, equity, inclusivity, and accessibility, a very long, uh, very long department name. Um, so I am excited that I can be here in this capacity and talk about West Side as much as we can. Thanks. Thank you, Claudia. Graciela? Buenas noches this work. Uh, <laughs> my name is Graciela Isabel Sanchez. I am uh, the great granddaughter of Teresa Cantu Rocha, who, when she came in 1892, uh, moved to a Casita at 108 South Laredo, so basically across the street from Goodwill. Um, I am the granddaughter of Francisca Gonzalez Casillas, the daughter of Isabel Casillas, Sanchez, uh, women who, and of course they're the men too, but I just <laughs> um, women who grounded me in the west side. And as we know, again, west of the creek was the west side. So even though it's downtown, it was the west side. And um, in 1921, we move, they move, after the flood, they move to Chihuahua Street. So at least on that side of the family since 21, we've lived in the west side. And throughout the entire time, again, especially mommy, it's like, be proud of being from the west side. The west side is good. You're going to go to public schools. Public schools are good. Um, she graduated from Lanier in 1942. Um, and I'm a 1978 graduate of Lanier High School. Um, yeah, my great-grandmother was that famosa chili queen um, and a bit really a businesswoman, a businesswoman who had that restaurant on the plazas of San Antonio's downtown and I also think in the Casiano home area, but also um, rented, sub-leased casitas on that same 100 block of Laredito, of South Laredo. Uh, of South Laredo. Um, 
Aside from that, I, I currently work as the director of the Esperanza Peace and Justice Center. I'm a proud member of the Westside Preservation Alliance and the Historic Westside Residents Association. And uh, thank you for letting us be here. And this is going to be a great conversation. Buenas noches. I am Antonio. Thank you. I, uh, buenas tardes. I am Antonia Castañeda. I am not from the West Side or from San Antonio, but I am a Tejana, and I am uh, from Crystal City, so 90 miles down the road, uh, 90 miles southwest. Um, I've been here, Arturo and I have been here, came to Trinity to teach um, as a distinguished professor, and, uh, a, a title and a position which Norma Cantu now holds. Um, and uh, I am a founding member of the West Side Preservation Alliance and also a member of the Buena Gente de la Esperanza. Um, and my primary work with the uh, WPA uh, and why we founded it is precisely because um, of historical erasure. And I th hope that that will be part of the conversation tonight. Um, the historical erasure of the building structures of uh, uh, the history and culture of the West Side, or at least that has been a major um, orientation, I think, of the city, but not of the people. And so we are here because of the West Side and because of its people, so gracias. And thank you, Trinity University Press and uh, Texas Public Radio for hosting us. Thank you all for those wonderful introductions. So I'm gonna go ahead and get us started with the conversation. And I'd love to start with the title of the book, which is of course, West of the Creek, Murder, Mayhem, and Vice in Old San Antonio. But I wanna focus primarily on the first part of the title, the West of the Creek. And if we, of course we know that is uh, referencing the San Pedro Creek, which we are right next to here at Texas Public Radio headquarters. We see it every day, every morning when we come in. But not a lot of people know about the significance of this area it's a critically important part of San Antonio history, both then and it continues to be now. Uh, but for those who don't know, and whoever wants to jump in and pipe in, uh, why is this area west of the creek, what was known as Laredito in the time, why is this area so important to the development of San Antonio then, and then why is it so important to the development even now? Whoever wants to take it. Um, I'll start maybe by giving some historic context uh, as somebody who studies the urban uh, environment and the built structures in San Antonio. Um, it's probably important to understand that when the first settlers come here, um, the, the west of San Pedro Creek was the grazing land for all of the cattle. It was a commons area. And it's not until after Texas becomes a republic that the city is incorporated, and they began to sell the lands, and they called it the lands west of the creek. Um, and they were selling them and uh, partitioning the land into parcels, and people were buying them. Those people tended to be the elected officials and some of the people who were able to control the land in a way that maybe others didn't. So that's, that's how it begins being defined as a place to live. And if you can imagine, it was actually a very diverse place at first. Um, just a catty corner to this, there was um, a barber shop that was run by an enslaved African American. He was the owner of the barber shop, but he was still enslaved. Um, right down the street, there would have been a livery or stables and uh, blacksmiths. And so it's not until later that this idea of murder and mayhem it begins created. But if you would keep in mind that that's not necessarily what citizens wanted. There were people who were living here who had children, they were families, they were law-abiding people. They just wanted a safe place for their children to grow up, for there to be community. And so even though this other idea of outlaws, uh, which is very real, I, I've done a lot of that history as well, uh, but in between all of that, uh, there were people who were living there, and it was not their choice to have this kind of community um, 
being built around. I shouldn't call it community. It, they were the community. This other stuff that gets thrust upon them is not there by their choice. So I'll leave it at that for anybody else who wants to jump in. I know, lots and lots of thoughts. Um, again, um, what I know from very little that's written, I mean, that's the truth, um, are, um, yeah, as you said, it, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a place, it's a downtown, um, it's a place of business, it's a place of home, of homes, of, 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 of playing, you know, of, you know, entertainment as time goes on. I think early on, yes, the shootouts, and I was thinking you were gonna say the hanging place over on <laughs> Commerce Street and, and such, but, um, you know, I think uh, Plaza del Zacate, or the Hayes, Hay Street Market area, where you know the Mexicanos who had just come, you know, many who had come during the 1910 revolution, just prior to that and afterwards, you know, a place that they all came to. And if you didn't know how to read, there was somebody that read the paper and shared it with the community. I think of you know Emma Tenayuca, I think of Lidia Mendoza, all in those common spaces. You know, not only performing like Lydia and many, many more of the troubadours, but Emma and many people doing their ponencias, you know, just like, you know, even if there had been a TPR, they probably wouldn't have been uh, running their stories, so they had to tell their own stories publicly, orally. Um, and so, you know, it was alive and it was exciting, um, I think. West of the Creek was also where we were starting to get shoved to, right? I think earlier on we were throughout the entire downtown area, and as time went on, this was, West of the Creek is where we were allowed to. For me, actually, growing up in the area, it was Soledad Street, so it was a little bit further east, right? Because that's where you had Solo Serve, Mexican Manhattan, <laughs> and, and that's kind of the place where kind of people shopped in the area, and if you were, Daring, you would go up to Joskies and places like that, just further east. But um, you know, I, I do want to kind of share the story of my great grandmother and my grandmother, right? That as a businesswoman, you know, at one of those moments, she sent my abuelita. You know, she was a young little, you know, probably you know between ten and twelve years old to un bandado. You know, go and get me such and such, but don't go down that street. <laughs> don't go into that area. But little Francisca was curious, right? So Francisca probably goes down Concho Street or some other street and goes just a little further south. And while walking around, she gets called on by some young woman, right? And she's like looking out her window and calls her over and says, please help me, I'm hungry, I'm, but I'm very, very sick and I need water, I need water. So my abuelita knows she has to go back and she has to be honest and say, oops, I was on the wrong side, with uh, mama, um, but this woman needs your help. So my grandmother, you know, probably was a little disappointed with her, la regañó un poquito, maybe, but she grabbed, you know, she grabbed a basket and she filled it with food and she filled it with medicine and she filled it, not water, because they didn't do bottled water. <laughs> but she went, and she said, llévame, vamos, show me where this woman lives. And sure enough, she was probably a sex worker, and she probably had some disease. And so my grand great-grandmother went back every day, every day, just to take care of her. Every day, until she wasn't anymore, right? So that was that intersection, at least in the stories I grew up with, hearing, you know, here's a businesswoman, but right around the corner are these sex workers. But as a human being, as a woman of Mexican uh, descent and of the values, it was important for her to take care of that senora. Well, I think even it's important to acknowledge, right, that while this book 
focuses on a very specific portion of San Antonio history on the west side. It is talking about maybe the more salacious, thing, salacious things that happened during the time. It's not all encompassing, right? This is not the, the end all be all of what was happening during the time. Like Claudia said, there were business people making their living here during this time. There were families making their lives, you know, flourishing in other ways as well. So I think looking at it, at it in that way um, and knowing that this isn't just what the West Side is, right? And so that there's still kind of that perception even, even today of, well, the West Side is dangerous, which we know isn't true, but it's still a perception. So can you guys talk a little bit about that? Although <clears throat> I recently wrote about celebratory gunfire, which happens in my neighborhood all the time. <laughs> With uh, New Year's. It is a New Year's Eve, uh, but I hear it. Um, I grew up in the late 50s, and we lived on at 1706 San Fernando, which was right um, near Lanier High School and so close to downtown. I felt like downtown was my neighborhood. Um, I grew up um, at, uh, with cousins, first cousins, who were already 20, 25 years older than me. Um, I was more in tune with their children. And um, my mother, uh, who was also born in the neighborhood, and her maternal family, um, all of them were th within a six block radius. Um, we didn't always, and we couldn't walk there alone, but you could walk there um, to my tia's house, to the Molino, to Ochoa's grocery store, to the church. Um, our life, while I had cousins, adult cousins, who were members of gangs, and some of them made it to prison. Some of them did it. They died as young men in the violence of the streets. But my life was sheltered from all that because my parents, um, working dad, um, uh, I just met uh, a man, Angel um, Ocampo, whose dad, was a whose dad was a friend of my dad at Division Laundry and Cleaners. Um, and his mom was one of my madrinas. You know how kids have lots of madrinas? Well, she was one. Um, and, uh, and so our lives were about family and faith and culture and traditions. So I was sheltered from all of that in my little house. And it was a row house that my uh, parents bought as soon as they got married in the, in the 40s and continued to grow towards the back so that we had very little grass at the back because, you know, the babies kept coming, so we added little rooms. And um, and I grew up around um, Our Lady of Guadalupe and uh, the Guadalupe Center that still exists. And I went to a pre-K program there that now I know is a precursor to Head Start. And I know this because Joe Bernal, the sainted Joe Bernal, um, his son was in the class, same class I was. I still have a picture of him talking at the microphone, and I'm right behind him, ready to talk. <laughs> and uh, so uh, uh, that was our lives. It was around tamaleras, around um, uh, festive gatherings, around um, this sort of insulated place that was so different than what was happening on, say, for example, on Guadalupe Street. Though I have a good story about Guadalupe Street. My tia Emma, the toughest lady in our family, ran a bar on Guadalupe Street with her sort of husband. <laughs> I don't know the name of the cantina, but I can show you exactly where it is so we can try to figure that out. And I think it's a barber shop now. So, uh, and I remember my parents to make extra money would go Saturday mornings to clean it up. There was sawdust. I thought it was so elegant because there was sawdust on the floor. And it was the first time I sat at a bar. I was about five. I still like sitting there wherever I go around the world. I like to sit right at the bar and talk to the bartender. And she, my brother and I were sitting there um, while my parents cleaned up and she would pay them something and she would she served us little cokes and then a little package of salted peanuts and we put it inside the coke and I thought I was living large. <laughs> That's the west side I know. It's very different from the west side as it was known when you have the proverbial question of is where do you where did you go to high school? And there's so many 
um, we judge each other this way. Even when you're 40 years away from graduation. Um, and, uh, and of course then we grew up, I grew up, we ended up moving farther west and I grew up in the Edgewood Independent School District which was so similar, um, also celebratory gunfire. Um, any given night, I just wait, I just lay there in bed and just wait till, it's an AK, it's like, it's rapid gunfire and somebody's shooting it into the air and I just think, okay, I didn't hear anybody scream. We're good. We're good. Um, it's that dichotomy of our precious um, homeland, our homestead. And um, when I was little, I always thought that Buena Vista Street was the best street. It was so beautiful. The houses were old, and I just loved them. And when I would drive down Buena Vista Street, I was always looking for a for sale sign. And one day I saw one, and I bought it. And it was quite the deal. And um, I know that those walls could tell a lot of different stories from all, because it was built uh, before 1917. And it was, it probably housed um, a Polish family, a German, German family, or some other family. And then it, it, it probably housed um, people who were refugees of the Mexican Revolution. And now me. Mm. <laughs> probably. So if I, if I may pick up on a couple of uh, comments. Um, uh, uh, Marianne, so you mentioned salaciousness and uh, that the book communicates that, and it does. And uh, so part of my concern is that that is still fundamentally the construct and the conceptualization of the West Side. And so while, um, I, Personally, I kind of tend to dismiss the, the book in a way because it is so salacious. But on the other hand, I can't, I can't afford to dismiss it precisely because, uh, because that continues to be the, the construct, the pers perspective. And it is a perspective that is historically, uh, until very recently, encoded in, in uh, city uh, regulations and in city, in city uh, codicils. Uh, and so as we think about this, then we need to uh, go back and examine those and review them and, uh, and analyze them and reinterpret them. Um, and so if we look at the language of the book, the salaciousness, the desperado, uh, the, the, uh, the, the uh, ladies of the night, the uh, blue book, and on and on and on. Whereas the people who lived there, just to pick up on 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 uh, the comments from from people who live there, have who grew up there and still live there. Um, so this isn't at the same period, but later, given the development of different industries. So people name not the Barrio del Norte nor the Barrio del Sur nor even Laredito, uh, which is which are the terms that are given to to the geography by uh, by officials. So it's people name their barrio or their community, their vecindad, uh, consistent with what they do. So there's the the uh, the Barrio de las Tripas. Uh, which is by the stockyards. There's another uh, barrio that was called Barrio de la Garra. I have no idea why, so I'm hoping that somebody in the audience will know and will remember. Uh, and precisely because these, these, um, these histories are not written. They are, uh, they are in the memories of the communities, their families, their parents, their great-grandparents, um, and embedded, uh, from my perspective, in the cellular structure of, of these communities and these peoples, uh, the peoples, and to pick up on, on, um, uh, on Elaine's comment, indeed, so the houses have memory, and the houses have histories, and part of our concern, uh, in the WPA as well as the Esperanza and the Historic West Side Residents Association is that those structures are basically systematically being demolished. 
And so our work has been to, our struggle has been to, um, to save those structures, to preserve them as much as we can. And that isn't the sexiest kind of work to be done. I mean, who wants to think about you know having to go to multiple city council meetings, to uh, OHP meetings, to uh, zoning meetings, to on and on and on, uh, to, to engage with entities that, at least myself, uh, I don't have the preparation and that rec those require full-time jobs. And as, um, uh, as, as, um, as nonprofits, we don't have those, those capacities. So if this sounds like a plea for help, for volunteering, <laughs> by golly it is. We need your mind, your hearts, your bodies, um, and your energy. So uh, vengan se, join us. Um, and I understand as well that uh, the WPA was a part of an effort to save one of the, the brothels that was mentioned in the book. So in the book there was Fanny Porter. She was one of the madams of the time and she ran a, a brothel that was said to be the hideout of Butch Cassidy and his gang. Um, and Fanny Porter eventually, she leaves San Antonio we don't really know what happens to her too, too much. Uh, there's not a, again, there's not a written record of what happens to her because so much of this is unwritten. Um, but her structure and her establishment perseveres and it evolves over time. So it converts to being a Carmelite sisters nursery. And then I believe, um, yeah. And then I believe uh, Father Flanagan's home for the boys as well. And then it becomes a structure in San Antonio that, Preservered and that was a part of San Antonio on the west side. And I believe that you all, uh, Graciela and Antonia, you guys were part of an effort to try and, and save that structure very, very recently. Uh, so can you talk a little bit about that and, and what that effort looked like and, and what happened? Well, that was one of the sad ones, right? Um, again, it was about trying to research about that building and you kind of gave more of what most people talked about in terms of Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. And it's like, wait a minute, isn't there other, aren't there other stories? But there, it's hard to, again, without the time to do that research, you know, we, you know, we did ask, we actually created a, a group of volunteers to do research on that building, to start looking at Cavalman Square and then just south of this area. Um, and, and, you know, we learned, uh, we, we connected Romana Ramos, uh, who was a midwife, who brought into this world into you know, 10 to 15,000 young children. And she was at 315 Matamoros. And she had a two-story building with 20 rooms. Um, and because it was, you know, and why? You know, again, were these the children that were being born out of wedlock? Have it, right? But she was industrious as well. It's like, oh, the women didn't needed a car to go back, so she started a cab, you know, company, and you know, she just kept on. She was just another amazing businesswoman, and that's what like the book kind of misses all these other. You know, I'm looking for that address within that one little map to say, well, that would be good to see what was the stuff missing that's not in there. all these other, uh, all these other buildings and what people were doing. Um, so we went before city, you know, before the historic design and review commission, and and we told our stories, and we got several of us to speak, and then all of a sudden, the city, the the lobbyists for the folks that wanted to take it down, um, you know, started courting us, and oh, let's go eat over here, and so they. I guess offered us tea, not even a taco. <laughs> I was waiting for my taco, right? <laughs> that would have made things different if it was the taco. <laughs> well, Maybe. it was, yeah. But, and these conversations went back and forth and with promises to maybe figure out something, right? We were trying to, see, like, what are you gonna do with that? You know, if you tear it down, what are you gonna do with it? Are you gonna build apartments? They actually had no idea. It was just, they were just gonna take it down. And then we t they offered that they would save a you know p you know column or something like that, and they would incorporate it into some new building. 
But as those conversations happen, you know, one day we all woke up and found out that at 11 p.m. the night before, this building that had been around for 120 years, that had survived urban renewal, that had sur comes down. And of course, we blame the homeless for yeah. taking it down, even though there were fences around. And you know, nobody holds accountable the owners and says maybe they hired somebody, gave them 50 bucks or 100 bucks, and gave them the gasoline or whatever and put it out. And it's the end, right? It's and, and our communities in the West Side keep on seeing these fires. And they question. Especially if they're old and they're not well, They're old and they're, I mean, on Buena Vista Street, and I can't remember if it, it's not Savinas, but another one, it's just beautiful. Oh, and it just yeah. came down, but I don't know that it was dil dil dilapidated either. I just think, but it's on a, it's on a. Yeah, but not out of control in which you treat them. <laughs> Right, so I think, again, there are developers, there are land speculators that are looking for land, and they're going to take it down one way or the other, and that's what happened to that space, you know, that somebody was going to make it happen. They were not happy that we were succeeding at the community level, and so let's just end the conversation. Boom, it disappears. Thank you. So since we are here in this, in this building, uh, in the uh, Nicolás, um, um, TPR. Um, so we sought and tried to save Univision. We tried to save Casa OR. And uh, we were told uh, by city officials, one, that building is old, ugly, and dilapidated. Why do you want to save it? Two, it has no history. This is the first uh, Spanish language station, radio station in, in the universe. Not in LA, not in Houston, not in someplace else, in San, not Miami, in San Antonio, and the first Spanish language television. And we were told by city officials it has no history. So when you're faced with that kind of opposition, and you're a nonprofit called just very few people, uh, and trying to attend to myriad uh, arts and culture issues and preservation, it's extremely difficult. So we've won some, we've lost some, uh, but there are, are more to win. And so we are looking forward to doing so. Um, I, I would like to say, well, thank you, first of all, because it was the bringing down of Univision that created the cultural historian position because of the advocacy of the WPA. So that was how I got my job with the city. Um, but something, as you, you travel through the west side or other parts of town that maybe have been underserved uh, by infrastructure, by the city, or I mean, by development in general, that think, consider that it's never the building's fault. So let's not blame the building for not being in the state of maintenance that we think it should be. Or um, that maybe just because we can't see the history that we might in some of the other neighborhoods like King William Mansion, that doesn't mean that place doesn't have importance to somebody. And so when, uh, uh, when we ask for assistance with the WPA, it's with that idea in mind that this place has meaning to somebody. And it's our job to understand that meaning and then to figure out how can we save and recover lost places. Um, you know, thinking again about all this outlaw history, uh, it reminds me that these were all transitory people. That they, they created this uh, image, a negative, scary image. But they weren't people who were from San Antonio. They're coming in and creating this. And it wasn't necessarily, it, that's not the people who did live there day in and day out. The Cortezes, the Navarros, all of the, the Rodriguez's, all of those families wanted to be able to go to church because there were a number of churches in the area. They wanted their kids to walk to school because there were two schools in the area. Everybody wanted them to be safe. Um, Elaine, when you were talking about your childhood, uh, my, my memory of Seralvo Street, and some of that was just like the naivete and the innocence of childhood. Um, some of my favorite times were when the streets would flood. And we would create little boats out Cops of paper and popsicles. would take popsicle. issue with that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and we were floating them, you know, our paper boats down the street. 
it wasn't until I grew up that I realized, well, wait a minute, this is um, an inequity. The streets shouldn't be flooding this way. Um, so it's, it, but I, so I want you to have that idea of family and of community. I could walk down to go get pan dulce on Sunday mornings. We all descended at my grandmother's house, and it was my job to go get pan dulce. And I could walk two blocks away, out of sight of my grandmother's house and her eyes, but everybody, other grandmothers were watching me. I had lots of abuelitas watching me. Uh, we go to Chapas to get our candy. You know, it was, I, I don't want to make it sound like a magical, realist kind of environment, but it was, and I think that's the sparkle of childhood. As a yeah. kid, that's how you always that's see it, right? You see, see it, it with a, yeah. a glazed light, and it's always so beautiful. Yeah. I've, um, I've tried through my columns and my stories to tell some of these stories, but there's only um, a, a limited avenue for them. And um, in so many of them, and, and s stories by my colleagues over years, is to better tell the story of all parts of town. And in San Antonio, what we have is the most Mexican of US cities. A geographer from California came here in the 70s and in the 80s wrote a story for a, um, an academic geographic uh, volume that, and the title was San Antonio, the Mexican-American Cultural Capital of the United States. And he was primarily talking about downtown and the west side, and probably the south side too as we go towards the missions. I mean, the cultural depth there is, is very deep. And one of the ways I address talking about or writing about these huge over, overwhelming sort of topics is to narrow it down to the creation of Maldiv, west side. The creation of LULAC began with two organizations on the west side that have scary names now. Uh, the National Order, <laughs> they have really scary names. Oh, the Order of the Sons of America and the Knights of America. They were um, precursors to LULAC. Um, uh, okay. Um, when you think of the pecan sheller strike, the first major Mexican-American labor event ever recorded in US history was here in San Antonio in 1938. And a woman who probably didn't even weigh 100 pounds Emma Tenayuca led it. And as many as 12,000 pecan shellers walked off their jobs. That's here in San Antonio. And so when you're so close to home, sometimes I appreciate being away for so long because I became a student of San Antonio and then could see, oh my God, the Southwest Voter Registration Education Project was born right here and Willie Velostic from San Antonio and the West Side birthed it. And when he was at St. Mary's and a whole bunch of other, uh, mostly young men, but I know young women were also involved, like Irma Mireles, Quien Paz Descanse, they were organizing the Mexican American Youth Organization, which was a recursor to the Raza Unida Party. And those young students helped parents and students at Edgewood Independent School District schools to walk out of their schools to protest the inequity in educational opportunities. That case reached the Supreme Court. That case moved Texas legislators to change the way they fund education. Still not perfect, but it's a lot better. Because the students were complaining about old books that they had to share. I had to share at Memorial High School, I shared my physics books. Um, we took turns taking the book home every other night to do homework because there wasn't enough of them, and they were outdated. But students were also protesting the lack of paper towels or toilet paper in restrooms. That's how dilapidated. And in these, from these beginnings arose so many movements. Henry Cisneros likes to say, that San Antonio is to Mexican-American civil rights what Atlanta is to black civil rights history. 
And right now, as Graciela can probably talk about, there's been um, a way to uh, exchange information between San Antonio's west side and the west side of Atlanta. I don't know. Um, you went on that trip. Yeah. Uh, uh, about 40 of us uh, from San Antonio went to Atlanta a couple of weekends ago. Uh, some of the folks in the audience were there. Um, and so we're trying to, I think part of the work we've been trying to do is, yes, the preservation of the built environment in the west side, but also the preservation of the people, the legacy, the folks who have been living there, again, 120 years, 100 years, even 50 years, right? Yeah, just, and um, so how do we do that? And it seems like Atlanta, at least one of the things that we appreciated was that they raised over $400 million to help uh, community members um, stay in place. When yesterday you were paying $100 in taxes because you were a person with fixed income living on Social Security, and then all of a sudden with all the changes in the neighborhood, now you're having to pay 1000 This is a quick way to push people out. So that extra $900 is coming from a fund that has been created in Atlanta. We do not have that sort of money in San Antonio, but you know how is it that we can challenge corporations, county and city governments and federal governments to try to do that? We're trying to build, create policies that keep people in place. And I think it's been hard for us to see any movement within the bureaucracy or bureaucracy of, of, of San Antonio and the county. Um, so uh, I think that's a big challenge for us here. And Antonia mentioned historic erasure and how when these stories aren't preserved, the stories of the people from the west side, the establishments on the west side, they get lost, right? And we don't learn about them. I mean, I'm, I'm from San Antonio. I was born and raised here my whole life. I'm not from the west side, I'm from the far west side. Um, but I never heard about Emma Tenayuca, and I never heard about the pecan shellers. I never heard about the significance of San Pedro Creek until I got to college and until I came here to TPR. So these are stories that you don't hear and that you don't aren't a part of every day. So being able to have historical preservation and to capture these stories is an important part of preserving the West Side. This is why most Texans, um, maybe your age and older, um, never learned in school that slavery was an issue in the Republic of Texas or at the Battle of the Alamo. We never learned that the actual battle that was really um, just horrendous was the Battle of Medina on the south side of San Antonio. So uh, we are, um, this is happening in part because we were not taught truth. And it takes a long time to finally um, discover it. And uh, because it hasn't been written that way. No, and I think there's a reason for that, right? They don't want us to, uh, they don't want us to know that history, that richness that the, of, our, of our people, of our, our, of our culture, of our you know, traditions. Um, you know, to, to make people feel good about themselves, right? The, the racism of this country, if the city is, you know, let, we hide it, you know? They say in San Antonio that there is no racism, and they've said that all along, that we all get along. And that's, that's a story for the tourists, so they are not afraid to come to San Antonio. The truth is they want us to continue to remain dumb as a community, right? We need, we need workers for the hotel, yeah. for the tourists, of, you know, for people who work at the restaurants downtown, for people who work at... Um, Fiesta Texas and SeaWorld, right? Those folks get paid minimum wage and they do not get benefits. And we wonder why we're the poorest, economically poor city in the nation. And sometimes we're second and sometimes we're third, but we're poor. We're a very poor city. 78207 uh, income averages $25,000. That's poor. If you have to pay $1,000 a month for renting uh, something in, in the neighborhood, that's nothing, right? I mean, that if, again, so they maintain us, 
that way they don't, you know, and again, it's a threat, right? Why is the state of Texas, why is Abbott getting rid of Mexican American studies programs? Why? So for a lot of us, it's about creating these alternative spaces, you know, so Esperanza is helping, uh, because the community asked for it, is build a museo. So we're building the Museo del West Side. And, the, and again, <laughs> we were naming some names, so go to the Museo del West Side. Right now, it's a, there's a website, but it'll identify at least 31 mujeres that come out of the West Side, so that, that they name Emma Tenayuca, if you don't know who she is, they name Maria Hernandez, uh, Arcadia Lopez, uh, Manuela Solis Sager, just, uh, and, and you're gonna have two pages worth of it. But in, in a few months, we're gonna have a physical space that you can go to and learn about it. And just wanted to go back, La Garra? Yes. Yes. That's Lanier High School. Okay. Uh -huh. okay. Why is it called La Garra? because we were so poor that all we wore were garras okay, to school. got it, okay. And it's a put down, and now, again, people have taken it on, it's like, okay, I'm proud of being from La Garra. We have a question come up, so if you can say your name, then your question. Hi, my name is Marcela Hernandez. Um, I'm a senior at John Marshall, and I am in a Mexican American Studies program, and I, I plan on attending UTSA this August, majoring in Chicano Studies. Um, I, don't, I forgot who mentioned, I'm sorry, but someone said that we haven't been taught the truth. Um, I just wanted to know your thoughts on courses like Mexican American Studies and like how that class would have affected your education. Whoever wants to take that one? Um, well, I'm here uh, a duras penas este, because we come from people who struggled all their lives to earn a living for starters. And we, sitting here, some of us, are of the generation that, um, that founded Chicano Studies and Aduras Penas. And so, as I'm sitting here think, listening uh, to the eloquence of my compañeras, colegas, um, I guess I'm also thinking of all of the young people, both women and men, uh, who we lost along the way because they spent their time struggling for Chicano studies and, and, and facing off with, with university administrations to, to establish Chicano studies and in the process then were not able to keep up their grades. Um, so at this point, I wish that I were, the only time that I wanna be young again is to be able to take the classes that are now being taught by the young people, by the, the faculty um, that, that took those early uh, Chicano Studies courses and still are. Uh, so that's my- You said UTSA? Um, I said Marshall right now, I'm a senior, but I'm planning on attending UTSA this August. Liliana Saldana. Name them. <laughs> there are a lot of people, but she, I think, is in charge of the Mexican American Studies, and they'll give you all the names. They're wonderful professors there, but also attend all these other. We've got Norma Cantu that's here, and she's at Trinity, but they have programs there, and it's about going, to, you know, to Our Lady of the Lake, visiting these other places at, at the universities, and just learning from those professors as well. But then also, what we're trying to get those professors to do more of is take it to the street, right? work with our cultural social justice organizations and, and share. And, and there's been a lot of that. And, and so search for those moments. This Saturday we have Lydia Otero, who's a professor, a retired professor at the University of Arizona. She'll be at the Esperanza. Um, and it's a free event and she talks about being a queer person in Los Angeles in the 1980s. Um, but you know we have ongoing programs, the Emma Tenayuca Symposium that we've hosted at the Guadalupe a Cultural Arts Center for every, you know for the last three or four years. That we also talked about the 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 flood of 1921. That we talked about the Alasan courts and the importance of those. So we have many many programs. So we'll share all that information with you. But please continue. continue yes. Then thank you for doing that. And I, again, John Marshall, but Linear High School doesn't have a Mexican American Studies program. Edgewood yeah. Memorial, the, you know, again, the, we're the largest population of Mexican American, working yeah. class and working poor at 99% of our community, they're not there. And at Edgewood, there, there's the, a 20 year old who's the, a board member, and 
his other colleagues are trying to push him out. So tomorrow, if you have time, at 4 o'clock, go to the Edgewood ISD board, school board meeting and support this young man, Mario Va um, uh, Michael Valdez, who's getting kicked out because he's asking questions, because he's wanting to challenge what's going on. So, and you as a young person, more power to you and we'll help you out. And I wanted to add to that that there is so much that, as we're talking about, that has not been documented or researched. Go look for some primary documents and, and learn from that. Look at some old newspapers. Look at old maps. Look at how street names have changed and how that has changed, has erased culture. Just, just things like that that have not been documented that somebody needs to take up the charge and do will also give you information that is not yet recorded anywhere. And I think there's lots of hope because in one, one little anecdote, I worked in six different newsrooms, and everywhere I worked, um, the book editor or the features editor would say, hey, this book came out about Latinos. Would you like it? Would you want to write about it? And I like, I had, I had the library of Latino books on my desk, and they were too few. I could write about all of them. Mm. Then all of a sudden, it all got away from me. Too many. Mm. I couldn't keep up with all of them. There were so many genres. And I was so grateful for that, that I can't keep up with all the different writers um, and all the different subjects that are being uh, proposed to, um, to publishers like um, Trinity University Press. That's really impressive. And I don't know if uh, John Philip Santos is here? He is. OK, John Philip, can you please come to the microphone? <laughs> because um, where are you? OK, come on up. Come on down, because the other thing I want to mention is that there's, there's exciting work going on um, right this very minute that will create new forms of study. And I want John just to mention the, the borderlands. Yeah, we have the mic. You can take my mic if you want to. Thank you, Elaine, uh, for waking John me. John Philip Santos, um, San Antonio born. His mother was. Um, Principal and um, longtime S administrator, superintendent, and glass ceiling at SAIST, and John Philip Santos is the first Mexican American Rhodes Scholar ever. San Antonio board. Senat puro San Antonio. So you know what we're doing right now at UTSA is trying to build a borderlands humanities discipline. So to incorporate. All of the knowledge streams that y'all have talked about tonight, um, arts, humanities, social sciences, that deal with the specific setting that we live in, this borderland space, maybe a swath of borderlands territories between San Antonio and Querétaro, we could say kind of broadly. So we don't just think about the border line itself, but to think about all of the unique disciplines and knowledge streams the chili queens and the musical traditions and the performance styles, the meeting and mingling of cultures that shape the world that we live in today that still isn't testified to, it's not written about. Our student earlier talked about the fact that she hadn't, uh, Marianne talked about the fact she had not uh, learned about Emma Tenayuca growing up. None of us did. None of us were taught about that story. Uh, it was ex you know, very effectively excised from the record. So how do we build um, a community of inquiry in San Antonio that's focused on the unique quality of our borderland setting, this place of contested cultural narratives? How are we linked to other contested borders around the world? Cyprus and Israel Palestine and Kazakhstan and you know, all the rest of them, the muros que no han caído, the walls that have not fallen. So that's what we're beginning to do uh, at the Southwest Campus, UTSA. And just a Thank quick plug, John you. Philip Santos talked about becoming Texas and about his efforts on fronteras as well. So take a listen to fronteras just in case and you can hear a little bit more about John Philip Santos talk about um, 
becoming Texas and about this idea of the borderlands community. Um, unfortunately, we are going to have to wrap it up fairly soon. It goes by very quickly, right? Um, so just any final thoughts about the book? Any final thoughts about this topic, West Side of the Creek, that you all want to uh, kind of end on a final note with? Anything that we haven't covered? Um, like um, Antonia, when I first saw the topic and murder, mayhem, and vice, kind of pissed me off that you know that's what was written about and that this got published. But um, first of all, all history is important. We all of it has to be documented. And um, I searched for madams that were Mexican. I didn't find that many. I didn't find any actually. They were all white, and um, and um, kind of made me a little proud. Um, but but I know there was some, and I'm uh, coincidentally just today I was talking to a lawyer in town who I asked, hey, will, will you someday talk to me about your grandmother, one of the most notorious madams in San Antonio modern history, and she said yes. So stay tuned, um, because that's important too. Because her family ended up producing um, highly educated. Um, lawyers, judges, <laughs> and um, and um, and and she was involved in uh, gambling, prostitution, and um, other notorious things. Antonia, that was probably the source of their being able to go on to school later. Oh, absolutely! <laughs> the of the it's what wealth. paid for lots of trips to Vegas for her later in life, where she sat at gambling tables for three days at a time, um, but also pay for a lot of education. So um, my comment at this point, uh, picking up on, on John's, John Phillips' comment about borderlands, is that we think, because I was born in Texas but not raised in Texas. I was raised al norte in the state of Washington. And so I am of the generation of people that migrated out of Texas after the Second World War to el norte to the Pacific Northwest. And so when we think about borderlands and our classes and elsewhere, is that I would ask us to think about other borderlands besides the national borders between Mexico and Texas or next Mexico and California and so on, which are still the construct of, of borderlands. So that's. Claudia, Graciela, any you. final thoughts? Um, to piggyback on not finding any madams of the time that were Latinas. Uh, the outlaws, I've done some deep research into the outlaws, they were all Confederate soldiers yes. to a T. I've not found yes. one that was not. Um, so just an idea to think about the racism and, and what that uh, brought in. Um, I would invite you to uh, go west of the highway to see uh, modern, current, West Side culture and, and, and enjoy it. Uh, but if you want to see culture in the west of San Pedro Creek that's still there, go to a place like Sanitary Tortillas. Uh, called sanitary because it was created during a time of tuberculosis and cholera and the time when uh, the first tortilla making machine came to San Antonio and is the one that they still use there. And it was sanitary because it was made by machine, not by humans. Uh, and they still have wonderful food there. Um, the One of the other buildings that we've been trying to save um, is on uh, Laredo and... Uh, in Guadalupe. Uh, it's a house, uh, it, it has a longer history, but what we connect it to is that was where the hippo bottling company was and the family that had hippo. So for those of you who have been here for a long time, you know hippo as um, a soda that was produced here. So the, the, all of that element is still there and thank you to Graciela for creating the museo because that's where we're going to hear more of these stories. And there's, Com conflicting information if it was Hippo, but for sure we know it was Dragon Bottling Company. Dragon Bottling Company. So Hippo, right, well, so <laughs> there's that. But um, but that is exactly, There's there are very few of these buildings left, so we have to protect those, right? And again, people say there's no money. The San Antonio River Authority, we're holding them accountable. They, they built this San Pedro Creek, they have spent, millions of dollars, how can we help them 
preserve. And we, like when we saved Casa Maldonado, which is now UTSA's West Side headquarters, people just said, it's ugly, it's old, it's ugly, it's old, there are roaches. And it's like, and in your house there's no roaches, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and they always, I swear, people walk around with needles and they throw them and it's like, oh, look, there was a needle. <laughs> Because it's like when I walk by there, there are no needles. Um, so help us continue to preserve. There's 900 West Houston, which is right in the, in the Cattleman Square area. And again, developers buy them. They're in historic neighborhoods. They're a district that was a district since 1985, and then they buy it 10 years ago, and they don't do anything and just let it go down. That's our history. How can they work with UTSA to make it student housing? How do they work with the Haven for Hope to put some low-income folks in there? You know, there's so many ways they can do it, and there's there's money if they just wanted to. But what they're wanting to do is knock it all down and bring in new people and go up high and not honor and respect what has been there. You know, if they were able to save that depot, which is beautiful. Why can't they save these other guess, you know, buildings? And I know Macri, the Mexican American Civil Rights Institute, was considering one of those buildings to well, headquarter theirs. I know you're trying to, but I also want to say that there's the Esperanza Community Land Trust. Talk to me about it. We have the manager that's here as well. And that's about helping people preserve their current buildings. Um, it's a beautiful, the West Side is beautiful. I love the West Side. Um, there's so much richness, and there's genius there, and there's lovely, lovely people, and we have to stop demonizing that historic West Side, because that's what's, I mean, my mom, who was born in 1923, said when she was a little girl, they said it, the West Side was bad. So this has been going on for hundreds of years. Please help us change that, but also help us create those policies that keep people in that neighborhood and not just make it all nice. Again, the Pearl's nice, but the people that live there are no longer there. Blue Star and that whole area of South Town, it was our, there were Mexican Americans there. They're all gone, right? So we don't wanna keep pushing people out. Why build a Museo del West Side if the neighborhood disappears, right? That's why we were helping to, you know, if they had taken down the Alasan Apache courts, a thousand people would have disappeared and it would have, not only hurt the Esperanza's museo, but it would have closed down schools, right? It would have closed down the Guadalupe Church. You know, it would have closed down the whole community. So we need to preserve, and we invite all of you to help us out. One more um, note, as if we were all on the same um, r wavelength. In just the last few days, I was able to secure an interview about this famous madam. Uh, on the West Side, but also Elizabeth Rodriguez, a San Antonio West Side artist. Oh, she's here? Oh, how wonderful. Hi, Elizabeth. We talked earlier, and I told you I was going to mention this. Um, March 5th, correct? March 15th. March 15th. 16th. Okay. Um, Elizabeth is going to um, inaugurate uh, a, a new exhibition uh, and a and an inst art installation of at her building on Guadalupe Street as a goodbye to what Guadalupe Street used to be when we were children. It was where my mother said, you never go on that street unless you're in our car. Never go down that street. When I did go through, I was always looking for something really evil. And, um, and so she's got a beautiful building there, and she's going to have this wonderful exhibit with 14 other artists, at least, who will remember the, um, that side of Guadalupe. And I love that she's going to have these um, puta dolls. I don't know if you know what those are. She spells it with an H at the end, which is so sweet, Elizabeth. <laughs> P-U-T-A-H. And um, they're paper mache dolls that are very common. They're not associated with brothels in any way that we know of, but they've been associated with brothels, and she's going to construct some big giant ones. So uh, unless uh, we don't have any more time for her to Unfortunately, talk. Unfortunately, okay, okay. no. But anyway, March, March 16th, right, Elizabeth? Yeah. Okay. Yay. Hey, guys. <laughs> Clap it up for the panel. 
Well, I think that this book did what all good books do, which is make you talk and make you think about b broader conversation. So thank you all so much for coming out tonight. <laughs>